So, uh, so before I start, I want to say that it's important. Uh, the reason why I'm making this presentation uh, is not to make people pissed off or mad. It's mostly to create a uh, space for self-critique, as I said before, and to create uh, uh, just a, as a way of analogy, if I may, uh, a way of us to sort of think about what's going on in the So, the, it seems to me that the way in which a lot of the um, crypto sort of space has developed uh, has become a, a bit of a sort of a feudal system. Uh, I call it virtual feudalism, so I'm going to call it feudalism, uh, and I can tell you why. Uh, uh, so, virtual feudalism uh, refers firstly to the political economy of crypto. So the land, the labor, and the money. So how is the land of crypto space distributed? Where are the mines? Who owns the mines? Who owns them? As I understand, many places in China, I don't know the bigs, but the production of them are made in China. The labor, who does the labor? Uh, I'll, I'll explain that later in a little bit. Uh, but it's most people that you know, produce knowledge about you know, making the system better, and also the, the people that put up exchanges, uh, even the people that do have the social capital, that's done about, and, then, and then we have the money, the capital, right? So not only not only capital, as in the crypto currency that come up, but the social capital, the people that do uh, the communities that get into the base with each other and so on. So how is the money produced? Uh, so I wouldn't even talk about proof of work because that's obviously uh, a problem. <laughs> uh, but a proof of stake, which is supposed to be this next phase in which crypto is going to be produced. Um, if you look at it, uh, it seems that the best or more creative ways in which most people in the crypto space have come up with producing money has, you know, sort of more or less worked as a as a means of a of a, of a plutocracy. Why? Well, because if you own, you know, part of a big part of the state, I think they're called whales in the space, if I'm correct. Uh, then the, the people that you know are in your chain, your vassals, your virtual vassals, uh, have to give some sort of gas or some sort of tax to you. And so that's why I call it virtual feudalism because uh, it's not uh, democratizing the production of knowledge, it's the production of money, sorry, but it's more uh, sort of creating a, 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 a virtual land where you can uh, uh, extract uh, surplus from people. So uh, it seems to me that uh, there's this essay uh, that came out in the, in the 70s and 80s by a boy called Joe Freeman. And uh, I think it's really relevant today, and it's called the tyranny of structurelessness. And this is how I, it seems to me that this is how a lot of the crypto spaces work today. And the title is self explanatory, but basically what it is is just, uh, you know, at the time, Joe Freeman was uh, looking at different feminist movements that were really against the hierarchical structures, both left and right. And they uh, were, you know, and they really, really wanted to create flat structures, more egalitarian structures. But, what ended up happening is that uh, by forcing that you had a situation where you know everybody in the room could, for example, speak and say their direct thoughts, but the rules were not explicit. Uh, you had really unstructured structures, as, as Joe as Joe Freeman says. You started having many channels of communications, uh, star systems come about, so different people kind of become the faces of the scene uh, without anybody really sort of democratically choosing them and so on. Uh, and there's of course a lot of confusion. There's a lot of confusion and a lot of Tyranny, insofar as people don't know where is power flowing, uh, and of course, you know, there is an awkward understanding of power insofar as people uh, don't really like to ask, let's say, these questions, right? Uh, but everything's in the blockchain, right? You can see everything, but <laughs> And then, um, so yeah, so first of all, the crypto kings, right? So these are the, the people that discover the mines, you know, they suddenly discover the power of creating money. Uh, my friend Brett was saying that uh, there's this myth on, bit, uh, on the internet about some of the early adopters of Bitcoin, you know, calling themselves the, the chosen ones. That Bitcoin sort of chose them to be the bearers of this new new world. So they're the early adopters, they're mostly retired. Uh, they have good intentions, which is, uh, is uh, I have to say. And they have a couple of gods, some of them you, know, you, you are already familiar with. So the free market, you know, decentralization is a big one. The ideology that sort of promotes the space is the one of decentralization and transparency. Uh, transparency is a big one as well. Um, we can get into that later. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah.
yeah. This is <laughs> so there's also the crypto aristocrats, which is uh, you know the sort of people that came after the kings. Uh, they are the people that have a lot of kinship, social relations with the crypto kings. So it's uh, the friends, the families, and the workers of the crypto kings. So they're the ones that you know get paid directly from the wallets of the crypto kings and sort of work with them and go to these expensive conferences that are like six hundred dollars each, talk to each other and sort of recreate the world that, you know, in which they believe that they are and everything just kind of becomes more and more real. And so so aristocracy originally means rule of the best. So uh, a lot of the people in the space are actually you know, really, really good at what they do. Some of them are just really good talkers. Uh, and then, of course, you know, uh, throughout history it's interesting how a lot of aristocrats have been uh, more or less really against democracy and they use voting as a way of legitimizing themselves into power. And so it's interesting that a lot of the sort of ways in which a lot of crypto projects work use voting as a way of saying that they are, um, you know, democratic. But in fact, you know, what is, what is, talking, you know, talking, what is it called, the vote, vote of this thing? What does that even mean? Like uh, the idea of that you have a token set where you can boost people's votes and uh, so on and so on. Uh, so there are many sort of different ways in which this works. Uh, we can get into them later, uh, but you probably know better than me. Uh, and yeah, and so a lot of a lot of sort of the big assumptions or big sort of uh, let's say desires be behind uh, a lot of the ventures is an idea of the automation of everything, right? And that includes politics. And that, I mean, put it nicely, it's a bit naive for I me. Mean, who would be the type of person who would want to automate politics? Well, you know, somebody who is in a computer and doesn't deal with people a lot of the time. Uh, you know, you can't automate politics. Uh, and of course, you know, these are probably the most interesting people in the scene, the computer wizards. Uh, they have a lot of magical powers, so they produce a lot of knowledge, a lot of interesting knowledge about uh, not only cryptography but also mathematics. There's a lot of logicians. I've gotten into really interesting conversations with a lot of logician friends. And of course, computer programmers, uh, although they call themselves developers now, which is a bit awkward for me coming from the global south because you know, there's a lot of people who call themselves developers there and you know, they try to develop people. Uh, and then, <laughs> so, so they maintain and improve the system. Uh, so without them, uh, the scene probably wouldn't exist. So they're really, really needed, I guess, in the, in the whole space. And of course, it's also a gender thing uh, because most of the crypto, it's, they're wizards, they're not witches. So most of them are men coming from Europe, the US, um, they're from China. Um, yeah, this is what I got so far. And that was, Um, independence, um, like when you talk about 
women who are in precarious jobs or who are in very exploitative relationships because they don't have the opportunity for different reasons to earn um, their own uh, living wages or they're just, um, they have to um, stay in exploitative relationships and jobs in order to make a living um, because of structural reasons. So one hope is that if we had an EDI, the women had, would have a choice to leave these relationships, to leave these jobs. Um, poverty reduction, women, and I, I'm saying women here, but I'm also talking about a lot of uh, women are the most um, obvious and the best um, study one, but obviously there's many other people who um, this would apply to as well. Um, but let's say women, for now women with the staff, uh, women are um, much more at risk of uh, poverty than men in general on average, so there's also the chance that an UBI would um, um, contribute to poverty reduction for those most at risk of poverty. Obviously, um, it would increase the agency um, of women and other marginalized people if they had um, a basic, a baseline of financial security um, to deal with everything they have in their lives. And much more. On the contrary, there's also concerns about um, the effects of uh, UBI and, um, on gender equality. And um, yeah, the first one is um, I think what um, Julian has been uh, talking to uh, about um, the gender question. And if I look at the UBI scene right now, I see that um, mostly um, mainly people from the global north, white people. Um, speak about UBI, write about UBI, are experts of UBI, so they would be the ones who decide kind of who advise government, governments who are trying to introduce UBI or thinking about it. So um, for me the question is um, really how do we get more other people into this world of expertise or points of UBI. Uh, there's lots of um, fears that introducing the UBI will um, kind of take away the possibility to talk about gender equality, to talk about um, the fact that women earn less money for doing the same jobs as men, because at least they get a UBI now, so what are they complaining about? Um, there's also a big question of um, the borders of any UBI, like the fiat money UBI would be limited to um, geographic locations which has borders and ends, and which would include people who are not living in that area or who are not citizens and recognized in that area. And um, yeah, the last point is about the, um, the way of funding a UBI, and there are many different ideas of how to like how to roll out a real world UBI and also how to fund it. And uh, some of these ideas include a capital welfare programs to support UBI, which is um, very dangerous for women because they are more dependent on the programs than men in general. Um, so my first finding would be that um, UBI would not in itself um, as such improve gender equality in any way. The question is how do you do it, who does it, and how is it supported by um, politics in general. Um, so yeah, I would argue that you would always need functioning, function, functioning and redistributed, and that's important social welfare system with any UBI that you have. And my question now is, um, how does this apply to a UBI um, scheme or project that is uh, not paid out in fiat money, but in, in cryptocurrency, because that's what we're working on. And um, yeah, I'm gonna do that quickly. We don't have like real answers yet, but, but um, we are trying to think about it and um, yeah, I'm just going to quickly introduce circles, maybe you know about it, maybe not, if not, um, there's um, many people on our team here today, so you're welcome to ask about circles later, because I want to go into details now. Um, so I raise the hands. Hmm? Who, is, who is with circles? Okay. 
So we have lots of one more coming. I hope. Yeah. Um, it's not coming at all. So I was wondering if it's coming. Um, second is a um, cryptocurrency BI project that has um, a few existing characteristics. I would say one is um, that is um, um, that is a system of personalized currencies. And um, it will be paid out in form of a UBI. There's no other form of um, creating money in circles other than a few UBI that is paid regularly into the personalized account. Um, web of, it's going to work through a web of trust. You can do transactions in a web of trust exclusively. There will be there's thoughts about having groups and um, having. Well, there will be value data who might make it easier to trade outside of your um, direct level of trust, but um, yeah, just that's the basic principle. And yeah, you can also track your transitive exchange. Like if I know who you and who you knows at, and I don't know at, I can still trade with that through Julio because Julio trusts both of us. Okay, that very slightly service. Okay. <coughs> So, I would say the potential of having uh, a UBI paying cryptocurrency um, instead of a fiat money is, um, is several facts. One of, is obviously the, the pre distributive aspect of paying out money. You don't give people money um, like you do in a, in a fiat, in a euro money system, and then you have to try to reach redistribution after it has been being paid out already in equally, unequally, but you pre-distribute it and you can try to do that in a more equal way. Um, there is a potential of globality. Cryptocurrency projects are of course not restricted to, to any like physical borders or geographic borders, um, even though I would say that there are other ways of executing people. The most obvious one is access to smartphones and, and and Wi-Fi, but um, yeah, it is not in itself restricted to any geographic area. Um, there is a potential of um, finding and choosing decision-making mechanisms which are um, more inclusive than the one that you had uh, when we talked about euros, for example. And there is a potential to um, for the users. To, to define what they find valuable and what they want to pay the money for and what they want to use their money for and how they want to rule their money. So um, there's lots of ways to, to include people in decision making, especially about value, which they cannot do if it comes to euros or other fiat currencies. So I would argue that cryptocurrency BDIs do have potential to be more inclusive, but they need to they need to use the opportunities they have and they need to use these potentials. And um, of course, the big question is how we do it. Next slide, please. Ah, that's my two conclusions again. So the question is how to do it. In this, I don't have the answers to it yet. We're thinking about it. Um, I would say, um, in view of what we've been saying, that. Um, it will never be enough to have a UBI, even though it might be the best of UBI that can be. And there must still be um, social politics around it to support equality in society. Um, but what we can work on in our projects like Circles is that um, yeah, we try to work on more democracy, we try to work on more access for different people, women in blockchain, but it's not only about women who become coders. Um, it's also about who speaks in a project, who decides in a project, and yeah, all, all other aspects of the, yeah, how the way we did it out.